Welcome to Game of Books with Kathy in South Dakota. That's me. And Christy in South Florida. That's me. We're two newbie writers sharing our take on wine, food, and mystery books. And the authors who write them. Join us for the fun. Hi, Kathy and all you mysterious foodies out there. It's May. It's May Day, as we're recording, actually. I know, I know. This isn't going to come out for a week, but it is May Day, and that means um, there's no more rain, right? It's not (laughs) raining anymore. April showers bring May flowers, so. (laughs) Oh, that was a lovely concept. (laughs) (laughs) But I am looking at... Wouldn't that be nice? Yes, we just, uh, we did have some um, not very pleasant weather recently, but I am looking out my window at some lilies, so. Oh, good. Isn't that lovely? Good. Yes. And it's not your daughter? It's an actual flower? Well, I actually, I planted a little patch in honor of my daughter. Yes. <laughs> so Very nice. I'm looking at Very. lilies, lilies. <laughs> oh, well, I guess we should um, go ahead and open this wine so we can, you know, get talking. I, I get think talking that's a great idea. Episode. I knew there was a reason All I was right. looking forward to this podcast today. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Okay, so today I chose, I'm going to grab the bottle here, um, Alamo's Malbec. It is from um, Argentina. And I think it might be our first uh, Argentinian wine that we've talked about. Yes. I'm glad you added that little caveat, because I was like, I have had Argentinian wine. (laughs) (laughs) On the (laughs) podcast. Um, Yeah, so this is from the Mendoza um, province in Argentina, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is their most important um, region for winemaking. As a matter of fact, two thirds of the entire country's wine is made in this um, area, which is located in the foothills, the eastern foothills of the Andes Mountains. And so, you know, I think I've been there. Have you really? <laughs> I think so. What? I went to like. Um... I went to a ranch somewhere and I, you know, they had like a show and stuff when we, um, when we were going on a cruise to, um, Antarctica and first we went to Argentina and then you, then we flew down to, well, the bottom of Argentina, but first we went to like, um, what is the main city? Buenos Aires? Yes. I would imagine. Yeah. That's really cool. um, what did you think? I want to hear about it. Oh, it was really cool. I mean, it was a few years ago, so yeah. um, you know, my memory isn't perfect, but it was <laughs> it was very it was very nice, you know, and it was kind of it was just a pretty area, you know. It yeah. Was, it kind of, you know, hilly and stuff and green. Well, it's funny yeah. you say that because the the vineyards in this region are mm-hmm. planted in some of the highest altitude um of wine growing in the world. And so it's pretty unusual to have, you know, kind of cliffs of vineyards. So right. um, that's one of the and things. So probably I wasn't exactly in the mountains. I was more the f- hills near there, maybe. Yeah. Well, and this <laughs> says it's in the foothills. So um, okay. you were probably very close. You could have gone yes. to visit this lovely winemaker. Right. I know. Well, and so this, okay, so let's take another taste here. So this okay. um, Malbec. Mm-hmm has concentrated plum flavors. It's Mm -hmm. also blended with um, small portions of Syrah and uh, Bonarda, which I've never heard of. But those um, blends add dark cherry and blackberry flavors, which I can can get all those berry flavors from that, can't you? I guess I'll I'll, I'll try another taste just to make sure. (laughs) And it also has well-integrated hints of brown spice and vanilla, which contribute to layers of the complexity. And it's supposed to have a long finish to create an expansive palette. What do you think? I think it's good. (laughs) I think I'm going to have another taste. (laughs) I think so. I do like Malbec's for the most part. I was and, and so, I was surprised we hadn't discussed one yet or had, hadn't I shared a, a Malbec. So I, know. I was glad That'd to do that interesting. today. Interesting. Yeah, I will mention one um, quick thing. If people want to go to the website for this, it's A L A M O S Alamos. Uh-huh. Um, they have got this really cool um, page on their website 
And they say, it's been said that wine is bottled poetry. But as far as we know, there isn't a written poem that you can also drink. And that gives wine the clear edge, <laughs> which I thought was great. Oh, wow. That's but great. They, oh they have gosh. a bunch of poems um, that they have crafted um, mm -hmm. to capture the poetry of Mendoza and the true oh, nice. taste of Malbec. So it's, they're kind of cool. Nice. Do you have one of the poems to share? Uh, of or? course I do. <laughs> okay. It's called Let's Heavenly it. Mist, Malbec. Mm-hmm. Flavors of black cherries and deep plum cascade like an avalanche, releasing a heavenly mist of violet and cocoa powder aroma. <laughs> it's kind of like a little, I don't know. I'm not sure who wrote them. Well, okay. But it's I, very you know. cute. Yeah, it's very nice. Yeah. So. Anyway, so that's the Alamo's Malbec. Well, Good choice, Kathy. Well, at least thanks. so far. We'll 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 have to re readdress it after you know yes. a few more sips. A few more right? tastes, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. So, yes. what's new so, then there? Oh gosh, well I don't know. I mean it's spring, so you know I was I've been trying to do some spring cleaning. Mm. I think I'm using it as a distraction. Okay, <laughs> that's not a bad thing. Yes, you know, um, I have been, you know, in addition to what we're, we are trying to carry on our lives and do and write our novels, um, I've also been querying mm. my book, you know, yes. and um, for those people, I mean, I don't know if we've really addressed it. Are you querying yet, Kathy? I'm not. I'm not. Okay. So, um, so basically, if you want to get published by... Um, by a publisher rather than self-publish mm -hmm. um you need in this day and age you need an agent because the agent is who goes to the publishers for the most part right and so in order to get an agent you have to do the querying what what they call querying which is basically sending out emails a letter telling how great your book is <laughs> and, and a little bit of information yeah. about it and you know like how many were your word count you know and you have to send it to an agent that wants a book like yours I mean I'm not going to send it to every agent because some agents are looking for maybe a non-fiction book about stereo equipment or something and they're not going to want to read you know a YA mystery thriller so that you know it's it's a it's a very involved process and then you and then they all want something different like maybe you know they say give us the first five pages or the first three chapters or the first you know, whatever. And then you send it out into this void and you're lucky if you hear back <laughs> from a handful of them because they're so busy. They get so many that it, either it's lost in their email or they're not interested in, and I guess it takes a lot of effort to say sorry and send an email back or something <laughs> because they just don't even answer, you know, yeah. if they're not interested. But, um, but so I've been doing this um, on and off, you know, for probably the last year, right? Since yes. I finished the book. Yep. And, um, and so I got a, um, I got, uh, you know, I've gotten a lot of rejections. <laughs> okay. But that's progress, right? It's better than not right. getting anything back. Right. But, you know, you, I, that's why I want to distract myself because I don't want to be like looking at my computer like if somebody emailed me. But for instance, I got a rejection last week for, and this was from um, somebody who had requested the full manuscript, which is a big deal because yeah. that means you got it past the next step. The full ask it, is what some yes. writers Yes. And say. so I was waiting and waiting to hear. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I just... You know, I've learned, we've learned, haven't we, from all the authors that we just have to like roll with it. You know, you're yes. going to get rejections. You just have to learn because it's such a subjective field. Right. It's part of the and process what, is actually being yes. rejected. Yeah. It doesn't right. feel good though. Right. And, mm -hmm. and just to give an example, I had, I had two, I had this rejection and I compared it to a rejection, I an earlier one. Okay. And so this one said, um you know, thanks. I like this. I like that. She was, she went into detail, you know, about some things. I'm not sure that she actually read very far because it was a little, you know, like maybe she didn't know who did it yet, but, um, but she was like, I'm having a hard time connecting with 
her voice, the character's voice. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, oh, you know, I wonder what that is. I'm like, you know, and and then she um, went on to say, talk a little bit about um, having concerns about one of the side characters, Bobby Tiger, you know, like he was uh, treated poorly or whatever. So I was like, really, really like, oh, my God, this is terrible. So then I go back to another rejection on a full manuscript. And that one said, you have a wonderful voice. <laughs> Yay. And I'm like, oh, shoot. Okay. Yeah, I think I'll go with the nice yeah. one, right? <laughs> and then they went on to say, we especially liked these character. minor characters, including <laughs> Bobby, you know? And I was like, okay, so that just shows you how subjective yeah. it is and how you just, you know, I mean, if, if, if it comes consistent, then you have to, you know, do something about it. But anyway, so, so instead of worrying about this, I went out and bought a washer and dryer today. Oh so, my. <laughs> yes. So that's my distraction. That's a significant um, distraction. I mean, you know, you don't know. really aim for small distractions, do you? You're like, I'm going to go yeah. for the major purchase. <laughs> well, you know, in the cleaning, I couldn't, well, I have such a little tiny one that came with this condo that I couldn't like fit like, you know, a ha half a sheet set in there or something. Oh. So I was like, this is ridiculous. I need to get a real size wash and dry so I can really clean my linens. And so, <laughs> and so did you get really? a stackable again? I did get a stackable. Yeah, this one is like a cool. laundry unit. So it's not like two separate things and oh, so cool. it's smaller and and mm -hmm. the one that I have now but the one I got is really a regular stackable unit and it can fit but I now I had to get the electrician to come out to fix <laughs> yeah. see you just got yourself another distraction so I good. know I know <laughs> so if you want any way to be distracted Kathy just come my way and I will help you out in that <laughs> excellent you know what you really anyway. need to get uh, distracted is another drink of wine Oh, yes, let's do that, because that'll distract me for the rest of the evening. No, 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 wait, just enough distraction to get you away from the query so we can talk about this great novel that we okay. have for today. Okay, 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 all right. Mm -hmm. So, ooh. so the book we chose yes. is Saving Megan by D.J. Palmer, mm -hmm. which the D stands for Daniel. Because it says on his website, Daniel Palmer. So um, we can call him Daniel. We'll call him Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, so um, this was a great book, don't you think? I liked it very much. I, did. I mean, it was a page turner. Um, and a little bit of the description in, of Saving Megan is it's a riveting thriller full of secrets and lies. And it, it's can you love someone to death? And so the main character is a mother and, um, and there, and she had, you know, has a husband and her daughter and her daughter's very sick, but is she? And so this goes into a lot of psychological twists and turns and yeah. whoa, you know, I mean, really, and it, it kept me going right till the end. I mean, no, I and, agree. Um, it's it is it's a it's a it's a um, a twisty thriller. I mean, there are so many plot twists and mm -hmm. surprises. It it really does keep you keep you awake if you're not a good sleeper, Christy. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know. I'm learning that the hard way too. <laughs> so I I did. Uh, this was one of my sleepless nights finishing up this book, but I just had to get to the end so I could sleep. You know, and yeah. find, you know, find. But um, so Daniel Palmer, he's a USA Today best-selling author of 10 critically acclaimed suspense novels. Mm -hmm. um, he published his first novel, Delirious, after a decade-long career in e-commerce, where he helped launch first-generation websites for major online retailers, including Barnes & Noble and Dick's Sporting Goods. Interesting. Yeah, so he's got that... Um, so now this was the first he, of his 10 that I've read. Have you read other ones from him? No, I haven't, but I probably will now. Yeah. Sure. I think I definitely want to go back and, and read his, his backlist. You know, I, I think, yes, I think um, he's, uh, he's a and very he, good writer. He's also a recording artist. I did he, not know he's that. He's a blues harmonica player and a lifelong Red Sox fan. And if you go on his website, you can, <laughs> you know, get his music too. Cool. 
Um, and um, he also, this is going to, you're going to find this really interesting. He actually was, collaborated on several of his novels with his father. Oh, interesting. Now, we've talked yes. about collaboration in a lot of different ways and with a lot of different writers. Right. And in this case, um, his father is Michael Palmer. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he was a physician, but he also wrote 19 novels, many of which are bestsellers. Wow. I think um, I, I, I mean, that, that is a familiar name. I, I can't say I've mm-hmm. read any of Michael Palmer's books. Um, but that's interesting right. because we've now yeah. had a father-mother, I mean, I'm sorry, mother-son combination, and now we have a father-son combination that we're aware of. It's so interesting. Right. But this was interesting, too. He um, he didn't really um, collaborate when his father died. He left a manuscript that oh. that he was working on. And um, and so when he was working through his grief, he decided to finish the novel for his dad. Hmm. So that's how he kind of collaborated in that case. And then, um, you know, he, that was called trauma. I don't know. Because okay. his dad did a lot of medical, you okay. know, things. And, um, yeah, so I guess he probably had notes and things for other novels. So he actually did collaborate, I think, on one or two others. Interesting. With, yeah, yeah. So that was it was pretty that's pretty I mean, cool. Really I sad. His no. dad is supposed to be like was the nicest guy and he's yeah. supposed to be a really nice guy too and hmm. well, So maybe we'll one day we'll to get to talk yeah. to him and <laughs> you never know. Um but like I said this book ha- had a lot of psychological aspects to it and one thing that they kind of touched on and questioned and we're not going to say what the final verdict was but um they you know the the mother was accused is accused or whatever is this given too much away you think no i think it's okay uh, i think i well it's munchausen's by proxy yeah which Honestly, you know, we've kind of heard about, a lot of people have heard about maybe, maybe not, um, but it's just a strange, strange disorder. So I was like, I just want to figure out what this is all about. Yeah. Well, now it's not even called Munchausen by proxy anymore. Oh, really? It's called Factitious Disorder Imposed on Another, FDIA. (sighs) Okay. Yes. Yes. And, you know, and it has like the whole thing where you're, you're basically making some, usually it's a parent, a mother making their child sick so they can get attention. Mm -hmm. And so it's complicated because they, you know, they don't know why the child is getting sick and if they can find, you know, like proof of like, I don't know, chemicals in their body or things like that. So it's really kind of horrible and it is a form of child abuse, obviously. Um, it's not real common. Like I think the statistics are something like, um, 1000 of the 2.5 million cases of child abuse that are reported could be attributed to this, which is a lot, but not when you talk about two, five, two point, I just can't even believe there's 2.5 million people abusing children each year. Yeah. I mean, that just blows my mind. But anyway, on a lighter note, the origination of Baron Munchausen. Okay. He's a fictional German nobleman created by the German writer Rudolf Erich Rasp in his 19- 1785 book, Baron Munchausen's Narrative of Marvelous Travels and Campaigns in Russia. Russia. <laughs> and the character's loosely based on a real Baron, Hieronymus Karl Friedrich Freyer von Munchausen. Okay. But it was a book. So all this has been based on a book. So I thought that, well, of course, game of books, right? Um, So the (laughs) fictional Baron's exploits, and they're narrated in the first person, focus on his impossible achievements as a sportsman, soldier, and traveler. For instance, riding on a cannonball, fighting a 40-foot crocodile, and traveling to the moon. So apparently this, the guy it's loosely based on, he was actually in the war and he came back and he would tell these tall tales. Oh, okay. <laughs> at, at parties, you know, Sounds over like a bottle a or something. Sounds like kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, so this was, so that's what it was based on. I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. It was like, it was, it, and the book is, was very, you know, I mean, wide read it's, you know, satire of the time. So someone who first diagnosed this, recall these books you know of Tall right Dan. recall the book and yeah. said oh we're gonna call it after this guy who you know told all these crazy tales for attention you know, I know. so i i i had never heard of munchausen's by proxy um until mm-hmm. i saw the movie the sixth the sixth sense have you ever seen oh. Have you ever seen the movie yes. The Sixth Sense Member? Yes, I did. I, it was like Dead an people. awesome movie. It, it's a wonderful yeah. movie. And um, do you remember the I mother? I didn't realize, I don't remember the Munchausen part of it. Oh, That's yeah. So at the end, it was one of the last scenes where mm-hmm. um, the little boy is accompanied by his therapist, Bruce Willis. Mm-hmm. And they mm-hmm. go to this little girl's house. Mm-hmm. Um, and, oh, that's right. And the little girl has him... Th- show her father that her mother's been making her ill. That's why she died. Oh, man, I remember that. Yeah, and so that was the first time I had ever heard of Munchausen's by Proxy, and I think that's probably where a lot of people have gotten, you know, their information, because it's such a bizarre and random um, illness, or diagnosis, I should say. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's what, so right away when we were reading this, that's what I, when, you know, when I heard that that was a possibility in this case, in Saving mm-hmm. Megan. That's what I thought of was the sixth sense. Yeah. Well, you know that it's been in the news lately. Did you did you hear about the girl who actually along with her um boyfriend that she made online or something killed their her mother who had been making her ill for her whole life. She thought she had to be in a wheelchair. Oh, she You know what? I did see that. Yeah, so now the daughter, the one who was yeah. abused all her life, she's in jail. For Boy, talk about life. complex stuff. I mean, you know, that's oh so what God. the legal system has to do with is this just yep. messy situations. Well, so, yep. but that is the background of this book. So you can see, I mean, when, as we're talking about this, I, I would imagine our, our MFs can understand why well, you got to get into this book because it's so good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah you gotta get it, into it it is good it's yeah. so it's so and it's so interesting the way you you know you got into the mind and stuff it mm-hmm. was really good i was yeah. impressed yeah very anyway good. but i'm really wanting to know why we have malbec with oh. <laughs> well it's pretty easy one i wanted to drink some malbec with you uh via long distance <laughs> and two um there are many times where um, the book references the mom taking not just a glass of wine but a bottle of wine to her Oh, yeah. Um, in her office at night. And mm-hmm. um, I got the impression there was red wine. I don't remember them recalling, yeah. you know, specifically stating different, a specific kind. But, um, right. and so, you know, the wine, it, it plays a kind of prominent role because it, it starts making you judge her parenting right. her character and that kind of thing. It's um, a tool. It's yeah, a tool. Definitely. It's a good tool. And it, it, it appears. But another thing that makes an appearance quite a few times is chicken soup. Oh, yes. yes. And I'm actually making some. I have some no. in the fridge. I, yes, I forgot. You're kidding me. Okay, no. so I so um, and this isn't giving anything away. The mom makes her daughter no. chicken soup. And right. it, it is kind of one of the only things that she can eat that she can keep down and gives her comfort. Mm-hmm. And so it made me I want know. to talk it's about, so right? my comfort food. It well, is, obviously, yeah. you just made yourself some. So did you use the recipe, or did you freehand no, it, or what? No, no, I just, I, and I, it's not done, because what I do is, like, I'll, like, you know, I had roasted a chicken, so I had the leftover, you know, mm-hmm. chicken and carcass and whatever, and then I So do you make, make your stock. own broth from the carcass? Yeah, so that's what I do. Nice. And then, you know, then you doctor it up and add yep. stuff after, and so right now, like, I like to do it and then let... And, you know, the fat get to the top so I can take it off because I'm trying to be health conscious, you know. (laughs) Well, you didn't have the flavor, though. I mean, you still have all that flavor. But my grandmother made chicken noodle soup. My Polish grandmother, that was, she would make that. I could drink, I could eat, drink, eat, whatever, however you want to say it. Like, you know, five bowls. And I was this skinny little kid. I just (laughs) love soup. And then my mom made it, and she makes a really good chicken soup. Mm. And so, of course, I have to make chicken Lucky soup. Lucky you. Of course, my kids don't eat it, so I get they to eat don't. it all myself. Even when they're sick? Probably. 
Because, you know, um, my daughter sleep. would yeah. now, you yeah. know, but when they were little, I don't know why they didn't. You know, it's funny because mm. my daughters, too, I love chicken noodle soup or chicken soup, however, whatever mm-hmm. you put in their rice noodles. Yeah, I put noodles in it usually, but sometimes yeah. I'll put rice, sometimes. <laughs> and, but, but my daughters will just prefer noodle soup. And they just would, like, a, mm-hmm. you know, broth with some noodles. But, um, right. But so I, and that I might be it. Maybe the chunks of stuff they didn't like. Yeah, the mixture. Thing. I think for some kids that comes with age. Um, mm-hmm. And going away to college, I'm just saying. That's a side note. But anyway. <laughs> um, but I wanted to look into, you know, why we all think that we need to have chicken soup when we're ill. Right? Don't, I mean, that's mm-hmm. what the first thing you think of. And right. there have actually been some studies about this. Nothing oh, con- good. Yeah, nothing conclusive by any means. But um, there have been some studies, um, at, you know, pretty prestigious ones that have been kind of quoted again and again. Um, mm-hmm. That Was that my grandmother quoted in that? It was. It was. <laughs> <laughs> we talked to the Polish grandmother A cute little picture Buffalo. of your Polish grandma. <laughs> um, no, but what's funny is um, one of the studies, so when you said that, that cracked me up. One of the studies was done in my neighborhood at University of Nebraska. Um, uh-huh. and the, um, physician had used her, um, Lithuanian grandmother's recipe for their oh, study. Oh, there you go. It was it probably just, very similar. Right. And it just cracked me up. But it, there are some, some indications that it actually does help that upper respiratory symptoms. Um, mm. it can help with the mucus. There's obviously a placebo effect. Um, right. And at the very least, you know, there's lots of nutrients in it. You know, it's um, mm-hmm. a nice warm liquid. But, you know, I was reading all this and I thought, you know, really, it's just a comfort food. I mean, I, I think it's, yeah. I, mean, I just think it, I it's. Know. And if I lived in your climate, I mean, well, I don't even know why I say that because I eat soup just practically every day and I live in the hottest place in the world. But <laughs> <laughs> but if I lived in a cold place, I'd definitely be eating soup. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's, for me, it's more of a seasonal food, I will say. I like, like, when it gets cool in the fall, I love the idea of making soup. Where in the summer, mm-hmm. I don't really make soup that often. Right. So I'm nearing the end of my soup cooking cycle. <laughs> <laughs> Darn. I know. So that's, so that's what I, so, and I, I, I did do some research, and really, if you wanted to pair a wine with chicken noodle mm-hmm. soup, it would really be more like a Pinot Noir, like a lighter red. But right. I just really wanted to talk about Malbec with you, so I chose the Malbec. Well, thank you, because mm-hmm. I'm enjoying the Malbec. And I had no idea that you had been to the Mendoza region, so that's just perfect. I know. I know. I know. All comes, all comes full circle. Okay, so I, speaking of full circle, let's talk about the writer's perspective, Miss Christie. Okay. <laughs> so since like we talked about earlier, we yes. talked about querying. And so I thought we could go into it a little bit more, especially since, you know, you're going to be querying soon. I will be querying soon. And I think yeah. a lot of our listeners who are writers and writing will want to hear about mm-hmm. this. I really think it's an yeah. um, important topic. Right. I mean, there's a lot of emphasis put on um, the letter. Yes. And there are ways that you, you know, there's kind of formats. And and what I've kind of learned is, you know, you give them the information they want. They always want what type of book it is, the word count. When you say what type, you're talking like genre, right? Right. Like, you know, it's, my mine's YA mystery thriller. You could be, yours could be, you know, an adult thriller. It could be a cozy mystery. It can be, um you know, a contemporary, you know, psychological, you know, there's a, there's so many that, so the first thing you have to do is determine what category you fall into. Mm -hmm. And that's not always easy, you know, if, cause a book is, you know, every book is unique. So it's not always easy. Sometimes it's, you know, obvious. Yeah. But Um, it's important because the, not the agent is, trying to see if they can sell it. I mean, that's the, and that's how right. they have to sell it is they have to know what, who they would go see in the industry to sell it. So right. it's, I, I think you're right though. I think a lot of writers don't even like to start that ca- category, yeah. you know, like categorizing their, their novel, but it's just the reality of the business. Yeah. And you, and like you had talked about before, you really need to have comparable titles and that's good to put in there so that this is all helping the agent. So the agent could be like, okay, if I love this book, 
I've already got, you know, I know this publisher that's looking for something that right. is, you know, this kind of book and, you know, is has titles. They just published something like similar or whatever, you know, because yeah. they they're going to have to do the same thing you're doing just on a different level. Yeah. Um, and um, so so that's very important. So the letter is important. And it's also important that the letter doesn't have any like grammatical errors and you get the agent's <laughs> name right. That kind of goes have to try without to... saying, but. Every... Right. But it's not no. across the board. People just it, sometimes people will send out um, just a the same one to yeah. everybody and they're like no no you have yeah. to be individual you have to like if you have something that you can say specific to that person to show right. that you've done research about them mm-hmm. that would I'm, be helpful i'm amazed mm-hmm. though christy every one of the writers conferences that, that we've attended um and we get the chance to listen to agents talk you know mm-hmm. kind of like how how it is from their perspective i mean i think mm-hmm. every single one i've heard has has mentioned Avoid those things, you know. Avoid just doing a mass mailing. Don't have right. radical errors. And I, I was, I'll be honest with you, I was kind of surprised by that because I just thought this is a, this is a business, and I think writers forget that part of it because it's such a clear yeah. Because you're yeah, you, yeah. If yeah. you're not a business person or you don't yeah. have a business background, you know, you're going to be yeah. Well, and you, you and know, you've approaching spent it so much time with this baby of yours, right? Like you, yeah. It's like trying to sell your child, <laughs> right? You know, to someone trying to pitch your child to somebody. It is very difficult to do, and so it's right. hard to take your writery, you know, writer cap off that's full of love and you know blood, mm-hmm. sweat, and tears, and then think about it from someone else's perspective. Right, and the next hardest thing is determining when you're ready, yeah. because you know you can fall into a trap where you're just like editing, 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 <laughs> editing, editing. Are you trying because, to make a point, know, Christy? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was being subtle. That was not I subtle. No, But no, it's yeah. true. You can fall into that. Now, I mean, yeah. you also are a very busy person, so yeah. maybe you yeah. don't get in as much time as you want. But I have For a sure. feeling that you are also – fall into that category of I wish I was where you're a, like a perfectionist. No, no I, I, I wish I was there. I'm not. I'm still literally revising. I, I actually just changed some chapter order. So um, I'm still doing content. Revisions, well, you, you, what you, well, yeah. So yeah. Th- there, ha- there has to be a point too when you, yeah. and you know, so make sure that, you know, you get like, I mean, I know you very protective but if you get some feedback from other people because it's hard to see your own thing and after you've read it like 20 times you start seeing it in a different way and it's like you know oh my gosh I gotta change this Mm -hmm. because it sounds boring because it's boring because you've read it 10 times already you know it's not maybe boring on the first time or whatever so um so it's very it's a hard it's the hard step to take you know for sure and I think I rushed into it myself because I didn't have any idea you know all the editing process so I sent it out way too soon but yeah. Then well, I, I edited and edited and. But we'll like see. you say, there's a sliding scale of like what's too soon, frankly, mm-hmm. what's too far down the road. You know, it's it's hard to find that right. sweet spot. Yeah. Yep. Well, good luck to you. <laughs> Thank you. And stop. <laughs> and I'm always there to be a beta reader or something. Yes, I know. I appreciate that. And you I just will think... stay up all night reading, just like I do the other books. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. I can tell. Mm-hmm. Okay, so. Um, once again, All our right. book today was Saving Megan by D.J. Palmer. Yes. And this wine yeah. is Alamo Smellback, and it's it's a good price point. Do you remember what it was? It was twelve ninety nine here. Mm-hmm. How about there? I think it was around 13 something Yeah, yeah. Wasn't I think bad. it's very, I think actually for a Malbec, I had never had this brand. Had you ever had mm-hmm. this brand? Um, I might have, you know, I do the, those wine tasting things yeah. in the store and a lot yeah. of the wines that I did were South American wines. So, okay. um, it wasn't this brand, but I think comparison wise, somebody else was doing it. I don't know. I, um, I think this is a, this is a, um, a, a mild, t- a smooth tasting Malbec. I mean, I think some Malbecs yeah. are a little more 
um, stout, you know, a little more um, yeah. full-bodied. I like this. It's very nice to drink. Right. I think it may be, maybe it's that little vanilla hint that you mentioned. It could be. Know. It could be. Or yep. the poetry. <laughs> Good. Well, anyway, so um, all you MFs out there, let us know what you think about the wine or the episode. And if you like us, please subscribe and maybe, maybe even write a review on like iTunes or wherever you listen. Because um, we want to know what you think. Uh, well, Kathy, maybe we should just say only if you have five star reviews. <laughs> Otherwise, don't say anything. No, 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 no. no. Okay. Well, wow. uh, we would love to hear back. Um, you can follow mm-hmm. us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Our handle is at GOB Writers, Ingma Books Writers, GOB Writers. And mm-hmm. we will be dropping hints on upcoming wine, books, and authors that we will be discussing or talking to in our Corks and Conversation yeah. series. I know. And um, that's all for this episode of Game of Books, where you can get your food, wine, and mystery tips every Friday morning, just in time for the weekend. This is Kathy. And Christy. Saying thanks for listening. Bye, Bye, everybody. everybody.